Imagine being such a big fan of Adult Swim that you decide to make your own animated TV pilot. You hire writers, voice actors, and an animator, and you spend two years of your life and $12,000 on it. And when it's finished, you realize, I have no idea what I'm doing. Well, that happened to me in 2019, and it was called The Oracle of Outer Space. What went wrong? What did I screw up? Understanding is useful, so let's find out. I'm Carl King, and this is The Carl King Show, where every week, almost, we learn about music, filmmaking, and creativity. If you like this show, head over to patreon.com slash Carl King and join me for just $1 or $5 per month. Or send a tip through PayPal or Venmo to username Carl Kingdom. Special thank you to my illusionist $51 level patrons, Hank Howard III, Sean Motley, and Chubode. Quick shout out to my music endorsements, Vienna Symphonic Library, Fractal Audio, Ernie Ball Strings, Tune Track, and Millennium Media. Now, let's get this episode beginned. Very good friends of Carl King, I have just two very short Carl King the Human updates, and then we will officially get beginned. Number one. The Oracle of Outer Space, my animated pilot from 2019, had some deleted scenes, and they were previously only available on the Blu-ray and Vimeo On Demand. But just a few days ago, I posted them for all to see on YouTube. So head over to youtube.com slash Carl Kingdom to watch them. Number two, I'd like to thank Rhode Island, for adding my video to their favorites on TikTok. Which video it was, I have no idea, but if I someday go to Rhode Island, I look forward to VIP treatment. And if you haven't already, you can find me on TikTok as username Carl Kingdom. And now on to this week's analytical filmmaking analysis of the week. In this week's analytical filmmaking analysis of the week, we are going to look at the Oracle of Outer Space, created and co-writted and directed by me. It was my first animated pilot released in 2019, and it starred Dweezil Zappa, John Schnepp of Metalocalypse, Mike Keneally, Joni Brosis, Leanna Vamp, Ebony Amber, and more. It was a complicated two-year process, I applied all of my skills to it as the lead writer, director, and music composer. I hired co-writers, voice actors, and animator Lance Myers. And I did a lot of things right. From a technical perspective, it was well executed. It looked good, and it sounded good. So as a producer, I succeeded. But the most important element did not work, and that was the writing. I learned the hard way that without good writing, you've got nothing. Now, my co-writers and I aren't bad writers. In fact, we're highly skilled writers, but screenwriting for an animated Adult Swim style show is a specific ability, and none of us had it. It's kind of like putting some smart and funny and creative people in a fancy recording studio with great instruments and expensive mics, except they don't know how to play or write songs. Some wild ideas would probably poke through the chaos, and a few clever musical hooks might emerge, and maybe it would even be entertaining in a twisted, anti-music way, like The Shags. But it most likely won't be an album most people could stand listening to, and that is very close to what happened here. We were obviously beginners, no matter how smart and funny and creative we were. 
So the Oracle of Outer Space ended up being an incoherent series of images and disjointed spoken sentences. On the surface, it mimics the approximate form of an animated show because it's got characters and camera angles and music and people talking, but it misses the whole point. So try writing a worse review than that. When I initially listened back to the audio only edit, I realized that even I couldn't follow it and it seemed no one could tell me what was actually wrong, but I knew something was. When it was already too late and the show was being animated, I hired two different writing consultants because I figured maybe they could help me add jokes or change the timing to make this watchable. Well, one of them didn't even understand the Adult Swim style at all. She had never seen those types of shows and believed cartoons are just stretched out characters hitting each other over the head with mallets. And the other said the writing was so off track that it would need to be rewritten from scratch. But rewritten how? <laughs> what is good screenwriting for an animated show in this style? It's hard to take anyone's writing criticism if they haven't gone through this specific process before or if they don't even have similar tastes. At one point, Brendan Small of Metalocalypse stepped in and gave me some advice and urged me to rewrite some scenes. And his guidance helped for sure, but I don't think anything could clean up the hot mess that I made. I played the show for some friends, and afterward, I asked them to tell me what they had just watched. And one guy said, uh, a bunch of crazy things happened in space. <laughs> and I couldn't get any more out of him than that. And another turned to me and simply said four words. It's not funny. Sorry. <laughs> and I knew I was in trouble. In October 2018, we screened a rough cut in front of an audience at LA Comic Con, and I watched a room full of blank zombie faces stare at the screen behind me. The viewers had no clue what was happening. But I have to say that watching people watch your show is a powerful lesson because you can sense when people are tuning out. Are the jokes working? And if they're not, why not? It somehow allows you to see your creative work through their eyes. So that screening bombed and the show was broken and I didn't know how to fix it, but I just kept going and completed it. So six months later in March of 2019, I released the show on YouTube and people were supportive in their comments, but there was just no momentum. I knew I needed to start all over. So over the next few years, I focused deeply on learning screenwriting. I took classes and I read every book. I transcribed scripts and analyzed TV shows and movies with spreadsheets. I was determined to figure out what I did wrong. So here's what I did wrong. At the start of this process in 2017, as a total beginner, I thought to myself, what do I like about Space Ghost, Coast to Coast, Aqua Teen Hunger Force, and Harvey Birdman, Attorney at Law? What is the thing about those shows? Well, that's easy. It's the absurdist humor and surrealism. I thought, okay, absurdist humor and surrealism, no problem. I grew up with Mad Magazine, Monty Python, and Douglas Adams, and I figured Adult Swim is just an animated TV show version of that. My two co-writers from the Sir Millard Mulch How to Sell album and I went to work. Like, this is going to be easy. I made up the characters and premise, and I put together a basic three-act structure with a cliffhanger. Over the top of that, the three of us added as much crazy content as we could. We decorated that basic story until it was unrecognizable. I figured we could make something even more chaotic than Adult Swim, because that's how you write a funny show, isn't it? No. Here's what we ended up with. Number one, 
non sequitur after non sequitur after inside joke after inside joke. And that is a beginner's mistake. In their comedy improvisation manual, Upright Citizens Brigade has a term for this phenomenon called going to crazy town. And they have another term called base reality. And that refers to the foundation that needs to be built for the crazy stuff to do its job. To pull off absurdist humor, you only need one crazy thing or one comedy premise per scene. And everything else can stay normal so that the surprise element has meaning and importance. Consider the example of the Eric Andre show. It is nonstop insanity, but why does it still work? The unsuspecting guest who plays the role of a normal person is assaulted by Eric Andre's chaos. But the most important part of that equation is the guest and their confused reactions. We experience it through them, and without that, the show wouldn't work. We wouldn't care. Eric Andre slurping up his own vomit off his desk is nothing without Lauren Conrad dry heaving and running off the set. And that is the straight man or audience proxy. Even in Parks and Recreation, there are normal characters like Ann Perkins and Ben Wyatt who ground the story. We need their everyday reactions. That way, Ron Swanson and April Ludgate can be eccentric. Instead, in the Oracle Outer Space, we made every character out of their minds. Number two, the dialogue in my show doesn't work because it's not really dialogue. Many sentences are said, but it's more like counterpoint monologues. It reminds me of those songs on Mr. Bungle's Disco Volante, where multiple instruments are playing parts, but they're not at all related. So when one Oracle character is supposedly talking to another, there's very little, if any, back and forth flow. They talk past each other and even over each other as if they're all in their own worlds. By the time I started to realize this, it was too late. The show had already mostly been animated. And I had already spent the $12,000 we raised on Kickstarter. Now, once we thought the show was done, I actually hit the brakes and did some re-editing. I paid Lance to go back and add a few reaction shots by the character Arcana Thrice, and some inserts of close-ups, and a few moments of breathing room. And that maybe helped, but plugging those pinholes simply wasn't enough. The ship still sank. But I believe the best way to learn how to do this stuff is to do it. The experience I gained was like going to school to become an animated show creator. And four years later, I think I know how to fix it. So now we'll watch the episode scene by scene and I'll pause to explain what I did wrong and suggest some possible solutions. If you are listening to this episode as audio only, I recommend watching the YouTube version. Here we go. But first, let's start with the name of the show, The Oracle of Outer Space. What does that mean? Well, it was inspired by a low-budget zine I picked up near Area 51 in Nevada called The Desert Oracle. On the drive out there, in the middle of nowhere, I was listening to and thinking a lot about Art Bell and his late-night show on AM radio, Coast to Coast AM. And I remember that spooky, off-the-grid, pre-internet vibe in the days when media took its time. There was less fragmentation, less interruption, and definitely less anger. There was nothing else to do on a long overnight drive but listen to Art Bell interviewing people about aliens and Bigfoot, and psychic abilities, and other fringe subjects. On that same road trip, I located Art Bell's house in Pahrump and did a quick drive past it. I thought, wouldn't that be a cool animated show concept? The last AM radio station in outer space. There could be eccentric hosts and bizarre callers like WKRP in Cincinnati. And I decided right there, 
I'll do it. I don't know how, but I will. So that's a pretty cool name. Pretty cool concept. So far, so good. Next up is the poster featuring fantastic art by Lance Myers. He did exactly what I asked him to do, and I love his character designs. But here's the problem. What the heck are we looking at? This is the top-level concept and characters that I asked for. But for a viewer, there's no unifying theme. There's nothing for people to identify and say, I get what that is. On the simplest level, there's no obvious genre. Like, is it science fiction or fantasy or horror? No one can tell. And why is that lady holding a plunger? And what's that thing floating at the top right? On the other hand, if you look at a Metalocalypse poster, you get it. It's a show about a metal band. There's a built-in audience because there's a surface-level identification. You don't need to be aware of the additional levels of ironic comedy or know anything more about the plot to decide if you're interested. And putting it nicely, the Oracle of Outer Space defies categorization. The characters really don't belong together. Putting it not so nicely, it's more like a messy garage or attic. It's a bunch of unrelated things jammed together. So mentally, it is confusing. When I took the huge poster to conventions and set up a booth, people didn't even register anything except, oh, look, a lady with three boobs. And then they just kept walking. <laughs> and other than that, it was very hard to pull people in. I asked several young people there if they even knew what AM radio was, and most did not. That's right. I made a show about a subject no one has even heard of. So how's that for an uphill battle? It's also very meta, as the theme of the show is obscurity. But I want to be clear, this poster design is exactly what I asked Lance to execute. I was specific about the character design, and he did a wonderful job of bringing them to life. So let's finally watch some scenes. The episode begins with a teaser, and here it is. Previously on the Oracle of Outer Space. This space scorpion's all over me! Do something! This teaser montage is a reference to Battlestar Galactica, because each episode of that show began with one of the characters saying, previously on Battlestar Galactica. And I'm sure other shows use that line, but that's where I got it. The irony here is that this is the pilot episode, so there was no previously. Anyway, in this teaser, we have seven recap shots. Number one, a space station the actual Oracle of Outer Space, which looks like an antique 1930s radio with satellite dishes attached to it. But there's no explanation. We have no clue what it is. Maybe some sort of satellite? Number two, a shot of Gary, the station manager, dead in a casket. But we haven't met him yet, so we don't really care that he's dead. Also, the main character being dead would end the series. I guess that's the joke here, but it goes by so fast, it really doesn't matter. Number three, that satellite thing explodes. And that would have ended the entire series since there's no more Oracle of Outer Space. But if we don't even know what it is, why do we care that it exploded? Number four, a scientist voiced by Travis Orban has space scorpions all over him and says so. An evil knight sort of character plays checkers. Now, we don't know who these guys are, and this might also be a problem. That scientist appears nowhere else in the episode or the story. He was invented only for this non-sequitur shot. Number five, a little robot lady shoots a laser out of her eye at the three boobs lady, vaporizing her head, but the head instantly grows back. 
But it's the same problem. We don't know who these characters are. And why does this matter? Number six, a green alien wizard looking guy floats above a coffee pot, maybe meditating or something. He urinates pink urine into the coffee pot. And another guy walks in, sees him, and looks frustrated or embarrassed. Number seven, that satellite thing explodes again, but it already exploded. I guess, does it explode a lot? Seems like it does. Now, I was trying to do a couple of things here with this montage. Number one, convey that living on that space station is chaotic. Things are always going wrong. The characters fight endlessly, like a band on tour stuck in a van together for too long. Maybe the ship explodes at the end of every episode, killing everyone. That could have been a running gag, but we don't know yet that it's a space station, so there's no context. Number two, reveal some details about the characters. Gary, the station manager, is helpless in all of this chaos. Bloodgore is absent-minded. Dream Girl number 11 of 9 is evil. Arcana Thrice seems to have the ability to polymorph. And Dr. Xeroz has a fetish for hiding his bodily waste around the office for others to find it. But with all of that jammed into 18 seconds, it is impossible to follow. On average, the shots are only two and a half seconds. Up next, we have the show's intro. Here it is. Hey, I'm Gary. And this is my radio station, the Oracle of Outer Space. We're proud to be the last remaining AM radio station in the solar system. From out here in orbit, we're blasting out the most creative and obscure programming we can, with zero budget. To get here, I've sacrificed everything. I even broke up with my sweet girlfriend, Mary Elizabeth. Will anyone hear us? I don't know, goddammit. But for those who need us, we're here. Extraordinary music, quality talk shows, experimental radio dramas, we've got it all. So tune in, and if you're lucky, you'll find us in the static. We bravely broadcast what has never been broadcasted before, ever. As you can see, Gary, the station manager, voiced by Dweezil Zappa, talks to the audience and explains what's going on. Now, this scene exists only because Brendan Small, creator of Metalocalypse, told me it needs to be there. He watched my rough cut and said, You've got to set it up. Don't be clever or coy. Just have the main character talk to the audience and introduce the show with spoken exposition. And that 42-second scene is the only part of the show that makes any sense, and I am happy with the way it turned out, so thank you, Brendan. Moving on to what we'll call scene number one, the morning meeting. Here it is. Every morning or night, it's hard to tell the difference in outer space. I call the crew into my office and brainstorm ideas. We're probably just way too creative. That green guy is Dr. Xeroz. He's our janitor, but he thinks he's a cult leader. I told him he needs to pick an awesome cult name first. Okay, I stayed up all night, and I've got it. I've got the perfect name for my cult, and it's got both. It's apocalyptic, and it's edible. This is the one, I'm sure of it. Presenting The Toast. Because when the end of the world happens, we will all be toast. Dream Girl number 11 of 9 is a toy robot who hates us and says she wants to kill us all. I know she doesn't mean it. Yay! I want to join your cult. You know how much I love the end of the world and breakfast food. Hmm. It is an ideal combination, yes? Hell yeah! What better time to die than while eating waffles? What? No, not waffles. Were you even listening? This is all about the toast. That's okay. I can start my own end of the world and breakfast cult. And I'll call it... Hmm... Ooh, I know. Waffle Apocalypse. Ah! Damn it, that's such a good name with the alliteration. How did she just come up with that? Arcana Thrice is our token blonde, religious, right-wing political expert. She's angry. And she's got three boobs. I mean, six boobs. Come on, really? The toast? Waffle Apocalypse? 
We're trying to run an AM radio station here. If we don't help Gary come up with profitable show ideas, we're gonna be out of a job. Well, it's not like we're getting rich and famous on AM radio. I hate to say it, but Dr. Xeroz is right. We only have like 10 listeners. Uh, actually, we're down to six. Four of them died of old age this morning. See what I mean? No one gives a shit about AM radio anymore. Look, people want two things these days. One, for the world to end. And two, breakfast. Who am I to deny them what they want? Gary, babe, are you joining the cult too? Does the waffle apocalypse allow you to have a girlfriend? That's the ship's computer. She thinks we're dating. To keep her from ejecting me into space, I just have to play along. All right, let's try to focus. What I'm trying to say is, I don't think some of you dipshits could get hired anywhere else. Case in point. This big guy is Bloodgore. He's a legendary, award-winning broadcaster. But he just can't stop cutting people's heads off. So Ooh. <gasps> I'm sorry about that. What the fuck? That's it's severed. Now, large parts of this scene were also rewritten and re-recorded thanks to Brendan Small. It originally had no voiceover aspect, so there was no exposition. Now, this scene serves two purposes, to establish an initial problem or character goal, and to introduce the characters and give their names. Assembling them all in one room for a meeting is a typical way to do that, but in trying to do these two things at once in a single scene, it came out clunky. Now, here's the biggest problem with this entire show. The ideas race by. Almost every sentence could have been its own scene. Take that first line that Gary says. Every morning or night, it's hard to tell the difference in outer space. That could be a whole scene or a whole episode. Two characters could argue about whether it's day or night. Maybe they're in their shared quarters on bunk beds and fighting over the lighting or sleep schedules. Maybe one of them is a robot who never sleeps and is trying to kill the other slowly through sleep deprivation. Now that's an episode premise right there. And as a skilled writer, you could draw that out and make that the central conflict. But nope, we move right past it. And for some reason, we have an insert close-up shot of coffee and donuts. And I think I did that just to keep the wide shot from being so static. But I think it ends up confusing the viewer. It happens again when Gary says, we're probably just way too creative. We zoom in on a shot of a whiteboard with ideas listed on it. And once again, that shot could have been a whole scene. One of the characters might have spent the entire annual budget on 300 Xmas trees, and maybe another hired a company to make them expensive vanity plates, and now they can't pay the bill. It would be an opportunity to get the characters in conflict conversing with each other. So these types of close-up inserts should probably be avoided because close-ups tend to mean these are important details. The director is like, look closely at this, <laughs> and what we're looking at is not important. There's really no need to flash more ideas at the viewer, especially in the form of text, because they're not going to be able to digest them. It's better to stick to a single, simple premise for each scene. In this scene, Dr. Ziraz is voiced by Mike Keneally, and he presents his new cult idea. And the premise here is that he's always trying to start a cult, and this is probably just his cult name of the day. The conflict is that Gary is asking for ideas for radio programming, not to help his janitor start a cult. But there's no conversation back and forth about it. Almost all of the dialogue in this show is characters talking into the room and rarely responding to each other. A more organic conversation would have been, Okay, everybody, let's start. Any ideas? Ooh, I have a great idea for my new cult. Cult? Come on, not this again. You said you wanted ideas, and this is my idea. For my cult. Oh, for the last time, we're not talking about your latest outer space cult. Ah, but that's not how brainstorming sessions work. 
you have to accept any idea. But instead, Dr. Zeroz simply monologues it all out, and no one interrupts him. Now, there is some back and forth between Dream Girl number 11 of 9, voiced by Ebony Amber, and Dr. Zeroz. But their interaction doesn't flow well because it's interrupted by Gary introducing her with a voiceover. So this is a case where the exposition voiceover is interrupting the game of the scene, and it derails the story and the viewer's attention. The ship's computer, voiced by Leanna Vamp, is one of those claw machine games. And I was trying to convey that its low-budget artificial intelligence is in love with Gary. And again, that could have been its own scene. And as good of a job as Leanna did with the voice, the character didn't need to be in that scene. Because this is a heck of a lot of characters and information, and we're only 3.5 minutes in. And then we meet Bloodgore, voiced by the late John Schnepp, and he is an acclaimed radio host, but goes into unexpected sword-swinging frenzies. And it's implied in that cutaway that he accidentally cuts someone's head off. That meeting scene is nearly three minutes long, which is a long scene for an animated show like this. And it doesn't flow. Even in those three minutes, too many characters are introduced too quickly. At this point, I could write a much more coherent version of it and turn it into an organic conversation with some comedic twists. And I did not know how to do that back then. And now we have what we will call scene number two, a message arrives. Here it is. It was a super productive meeting. And then a message arrived. Incoming transmission. Transmission of news incoming. Breaking news. This is amazing, y'all. Just moments ago, a new president of the Planetary Federation was elected. With a trillion jactillion YouTube views, welcome my president, two giraffes with diarrhea. Ladies and pseudopods, the most viewed YouTube video automatically becomes president. Huh. Says here in the description they're fierce opponents of public broadcasting and also public niceness. What? That's weird. I can barely afford to pay the artificial gravity bill. And now we're going to be defunded by a pair of incontinent ungulates? We need to do the first thing that comes to mind. Oh, vanity plates. Cyanide biscuits. We could ask our listeners for money. That would never work. Arcana Thrice, voiced by Joni Brosis, reads a fax. Anyone remember fax machines? A new president of the Planetary Federation has just been elected. So in this bizarro world, the most viewed YouTube video automatically becomes president. And in this case, it's two giraffes with diarrhea. So our characters believe those two giraffes are politically conservative and are going to cut the funding for public radio broadcasting. In storytelling, this is called the inciting incident. This is where things first go wrong and where the characters need to take action to solve it. But losing their funding and being broke is too general. It's not an acute and immediate threat because these guys are always broke. Being broke is a slow and boring problem and just doesn't make for a catchy story. As in, did you hear that story about the AM radio station? They went broke. Well, no one cares if an AM radio station is having financial trouble, so the obstacle needs to be something more surprising and juicy. It's got to have that now-I-need-to-know-what-happens factor. The problem should also be a problem that the characters can solve or attempt to solve by the end of this 11 and a half minute episode. Now, if it's an Adult Swim-style show, that problem can, of course, be absurd, like... Maybe recruits for Dr. Zeroz's cult show up from all over the galaxy and take over the station. But maybe they all happen to be senior citizens, or maybe they're even more competent than he is, so he quickly regrets it and the crew needs to work together to take back control. We only need one obstacle like that per episode. Now, here's another problem in this scene. The characters have no reaction to the surreal two giraffes with diarrhea becoming president event. 
It's major and unexpected, but there's barely any commentary or discussion among them. It's an opportunity for one character to think, this is great news, and another to think, this is terrible news, setting them up to fight about it. But instead, they all just accept it as completely normal, and no one but Gary cares about their funding being cut. So there should be a proxy for the audience, meaning one or more characters should reflect the absurdity of the situation. There's already too much going on in this episode, but the premise of the giraffes could have been an entire scene. It deserved more than a couple of sentences before zooming past it onto the next wacky thing. Now on to scene three, Pledge Drive. Here it is, and please try to make it through it. I've got it. Let's do a pledge drive. Pledge drive, Engager, is engaging. Pledge drive. And so, with the threat of the new president revoking our funding, we embarked on our first pledge drive. You know, when radio stations had to beg for money? The 20th century version of Kickstarter. Hello, listeners. Causing your radio to make a sound requires a radio signal, or blunt force trauma. We would like to ask you for... Oh, um, complete submission to our programming doctrine to decorate your meaningless life with meaningless sounds. Join us in The Toasting, the only pre-apocalyptic cult to be post-apocalyptically correct. Yes, listeners, for a large offering and power of attorney, you too can... Warning alert. Warning alert. Gary, babe, you have a caller. At this hour? Do I need to worry? Announcer, please announce. Hello? Unfortunately, our listeners are as weird and financially challenged as we are. This is bang on. Hello? One minute in. You're on the air. This is waxy casket fingers. Waxy casket fingers. That's great. Okay, where are you calling I'm from? I'm an undertaker. Aw, thank you for your service. Golly, what does it feel like to be a hero? My heart is broken and it's your fault. Explain yourself. Unfortunately, I can't explain myself. I only have a few nickels and pennies. Oh. You're on the air with the Oracle of Outer Space. space, space, space. Cats have whiskers. Daddies have whiskies. Um. Hey, I know this guy. Mom? Castles have moats. Daddies have throats. Mommy? I think it's a riddle. Who here is good at riddles? Birds of a feather. Daddies wear leather. That's amazing. <laughs> We're going to send you an official Oracle of Outer Space crew jacket. Do we have crew jackets? Gary, you seem distant. Am I in the friend zone? <coughs> Failure. My bad. Oh, hold on. Ah, it's th no, it's that one. Hey, this is Axel Rose. Wow, are you really Axel Rose? Loser. Nah, I get that all the time. That, that's anyway, supposed to do that. I got a theory about I water think. and aliens. Swimming pools don't count because they're a manufactured ecosystem. I actually call them squeakosystems for short. Now hold on. When you say squeakosystems, are you referring shit? to the 1770s Who Bavarian conspiracy shit? theory or Who the family board game? Because I'm technically an expert on both. Uh, sorry guys. It's, 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 whichever one you want. I rock the board game or the conspiracy theory from Bavaria. That's not broken. Don't worry. Shit? I'm an expert. Who I'm serious. Hey guys. Hey, Who gives a shit? Should we give up? Come on. Here okay, we go. we've got Yoga Mommy Warbucks from north of the Rockies. You're on the air. Can we count on you for five dollars? Ten dollars? Fifty? Tell her five hundred or we hang up on you. That's how you do it. I need advice. Please speak clearly. Aha! Dream girl number 11 of 9 here is the host of Ask the Misanthropic Mannequin of the Macabre, our popular call-in advice show. Ooh, what is your question, Tube Creature? Okay, so what would you do if some pockmarked guy... Uh, I mean... He's okay, a nice guy, what part of his but, body are the pockmarks yeah, on? That's the problem. I can't really tell. Would you go to his party? Of course I would. Free will is an illusion. <sighs> My other question. Dial tone. Call lost. Who's up next? Hello? Uh, hello? Oh, hold on. I think it's this one. Hello? Hello? Somebody there? Oh, are you talking to me? Ugh, no! Vectal test failed. Going once? Hey, y'all. Going twice? Hello? Hello? Is somebody there? Oh. Is it this one? You're listening. Oh, there you are. Hello? Uh, could you turn down your radio, please? Not again. No, no. Oh, God. Ugh, no. Oh, you're oh, listening. Shut up. <gasps> Whatever. She's oh, terrible. Oh, Art Bell about LaGrange, the dream I had last night? Alpha. Um, Art Bell doesn't live here. This is the Oracle of Outer Space, you dumb piece of shit. Uh, <laughs> well, I guess I'll tell you then. Come on. A strange, big, dusty house. 
The light is shining through the windows at strange angles. Convinced it was a laser imp. A laser imp? That's stupid. Look, I'm in the middle of a difficult ritual. Dr. Zeros needs total concentration. It's really a bad time to call right now. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Let's go to... Would you like to introduce yourself? I'll give you a hint. Hello, Sloppy, Stan. toothless, agoraphobic, nincompoof. <laughs> You're Satan, aren't you? Do, do I get the full Are box you? set for Confirmed. a 20 soul donation? Satan. Oh no, the other one's gonna get me! Oh, Satan, take away! Excuse me, Mr. or Mrs. Satan? Gives yes? a shit. Hang on a second. Who gives a shit? Hang on. <laughs> Who gives a shit? <laughs> wow, you guys aren't ready for <laughs> AM radio. You're ready to do a podcast. Low fuel alert. Pledge drive disengager must now disengage. Pledge drive. Great. Total failure. We're still broke, and now we're out of gas. Now, let's see what went wrong here. Gary is afraid that two giraffes with diarrhea will cancel their funding. So they activate the pledge drive, which is a stupid joke about how spaceships have a warp drive. This one has a pledge drive. But instead of going straight into the pledge drive and taking callers, two of the characters interrupt the flow and give mini monologues. I was trying to creatively reveal character details here. Dream Girl number 11 of 9 expresses her malevolence, and Dr. Ziraz goes on about his cult again. But what they say is distracting and confusing. For the next four minutes, it's total chaos. And four minutes is a very long time for nothing much to happen on a TV show. The plot doesn't advance, and it's just noise. Everyone is talking at once, the mixing board is malfunctioning, and it is impossible to follow. And of course, we also introduce even more confusing characters, including Announcer, voiced by Nils Rurak, and that character's only real purpose is to repeatedly say, who gives a S anytime Bloodgore talks? You know, because this show needed yet another layer of dissonance and confusion. The callers were some of my Kickstarter backers, and while it was fun to do, and they did a good job, their characters and this whole scene were too confusing. The pledge drive could have been cut out, and it wouldn't have made a difference to the story. So now we've got scene number four, the vice demi-regent of public programming matter affairs. So let's see it. Shuttle now docking. Now at shuttle docking bay five. Ugh, what now? Yes? Can I help you? The vice demi-regent of public programming matter affairs has arrived. I couldn't believe it! My ex-girlfriend Mary Elizabeth had already been promoted to Vice Demi Regent of Public Programming Matter Affairs. Maybe she had come to help us. It's good to see you again, Gary. President Two Giraffes with Diarrhea sent me here immediately. This pathetic little creative dream is over. You need to come back to Northport Atlantis 7 with me. Gary! We'll make a baby Gary that cries as much as you do while I go out and achieve things. Negative. Initiating self-destruct. Fuck! I don't wanna die, I don't wanna die, I don't wanna die! Don't there, wanna Gary die. stays. We all die. Hello, Dad! Prepare for fire. the toes! Fire. Everything's on fire, including me! Don't worry, I got this. I, I don't get Gary, stop fucking uh, around! Oh, I think it's Waffle Apocalypse. Come on! No, it's the toast! Yeah, hide the toast! Damn it! Can Gary save the crew from becoming a burning apocalyptic omen in the sky? Or will this be the extinction of AM radio as we know it? What is the ultimate fate of the universe? And is masculinity a mental illness? Find out next week on The Oracle of Outer Space. A tall Amazon warrior looking woman strides in and she is voiced by Clark Wolf. It turns out she is Gary's ex-girlfriend and this is Gary's worst nightmare. The dominating girlfriend he ran away from to start the radio station is now here to decide his fate. We have the potential for major conflict here, and there originally was. Unfortunately, the episode was already too long with the pledge drive, so I had to cut a lot out. In the deleted scene, the characters all had a chance to pitch 
their new creative show ideas to the vice demi regent of public programming matter affairs, which actually serve the same purpose as scene number one. At this point, we're almost 10 minutes into what should be an 11 and a half minute episode. So this scene could have happened right after the two giraffes with diarrhea. Gary could have said to the vice demi regent, wow, how did you get here so fast? So instead of that whole complex pitching show ideas scene, I trimmed it down. The vice demi regent simply threatens to take Gary back home with her to Northport Atlantis 7. And out of jealousy, the ship's computer, who's in love with Gary, initiates self-destruct. And we have more chaos as Gary tries to remember the password and cancel the self-destruct. It all ends on a cliffhanger as the Oracle of Outer Space burns and falls from orbit. There's a Star Wars title crawl, ironically, at the end of the episode instead of at the beginning. Looking back, I think it is a cop-out move for the ship to self-destruct at the end. I think that's how a beginner avoids writing a good ending. Okay, so let's sum up my mistakes. Number one, the poster image doesn't communicate a genre, and the characters don't visually fit together. And that's not necessarily bad, but it is confusing and makes it an uphill battle to market. Number two... Back in 2017, I simply didn't have the skills to write an animated show. I hadn't studied the specifics of the form or taken the shows I like apart and put them back together again. I underestimated the importance of screenwriting rules. Number three, the obstacle that the characters face in this episode isn't acute and immediate enough. An AM radio station going broke is not a worthwhile story. No one cares, and it is a boring problem. Number four, there's very little conversation between the characters. They're in their own worlds, dual monologuing, and cleverly talking past each other. The focus is hyper-associative. The subject changes almost every sentence, making it impossible to follow. Number five, I took this show to crazy town, and there was no base reality for the non sequiturs to do their job. If everything is unusual, nothing is unusual. So do I regret making the Oracle of Outer Space? Absolutely not. As I said, I think I applied all of my technical and creative skills to this and succeeded in producing a show. And I probably learned more than I would have if I paid for film school. So I took everything I learned and immediately made a second animated pilot, That Monster Show. And now I'm almost done with my third called Dragon Tooth Inn. So as I keep making shows and keep making these mistakes in public, my writing and directing skills are forced to improve. So if you have an idea for a song or an album or a comedy sketch or a book or a movie, I recommend you go out there and make it. Just do a bad job, figure out why it was bad, and then do less of a bad job the next time. Repeat that process, and in a few years, you'll be doing good work. Because that's how we learn and improve, I hope. Okay, that's the end of this episode of The Carl King Show. Remember to subscribe on Spotify, Apple, YouTube, or anywhere else you consume these dang episodes. And if you like this show, support the creation of more episodes by joining my Patreon for $1 or $5 a month. That's patreon.com slash Carl King. Or send a tip through PayPal or Venmo to username Carl Kingdom. Thank you to my little production team, my script editor Chris Higgins, and my transcriptionist Eric Alexander Moore. My Patreon patrons help me to also pay those guys. And a special thank you to my $51 a month patrons at the special illusionist level, Chubode, Sean Motley, and Hank Howard III. And thank you to all of the very good friends of Carl King for joining me. And as I always say, Ronald that. <laughs>